Hello there, my name's Angela Wright and I'm Professor of Romantic Literature in the School of English at the University of Sheffield and together with um, Dale Townsend who's Professor of Gothic Literature at Manchester Metropolitan University I'm co-editor of Volumes 1 and 2 of a new Cambridge History of the Gothic and we're very excited that this has just come into print these past few months I'm so excited to see all of the very rich chapters in both volumes and how well they work together. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about volume one um, of the Cambridge History of the Gothic. This volume is called The Long 18th Century and we must admit that it's a very elastic um, long 18th century because um, in this volume we start off with an essay on the Goths um, and then track up to the, the term Gothic in the long 18th century. So in fact, although it's about the 18th century and we've got many chapters on the key authors that you might expect in the 18th century, such as Anne Radcliffe and Matthew Lewis, and some of the um, less well-known Minerva Gothics, as well as you know, material in William Beckford, there's also a much richer sense of Gothic from its inception up until the end of the 18th century. Um, so with Catherine Spooner, who is professor at Lancaster University and the lead editor of volume three, um, Dale and I wrote um, with Catherine a 20 page introduction to volume one where we trace a relationship between gothic and history um, from the very beginnings of a gothic movement right up until the 21st century and in the process of composing that um, introduction between the three of us you know we discovered just how the interrelationship between the gothic and history is so continually important throughout the different centuries that we've enjoyed reading and consuming the Gothic. Um, the introduction also considers a relationship between historiography and how the Gothic continually interacts with that in the 18th century and beyond. And I think that for those reasons, it becomes truly important because it's a Cambridge history of the Gothic. And I think that that's a unique point about a Cambridge history of the Gothic that makes it different to the companions to Gothic with which we may be more familiar. It's that sense of, you know, how we're trying to think about the history of relationships between writers and political movements at the time they were writing and the way in which gothic and history often interacted at key points of the centuries. So David Gwynne begins with the chapter on the goths in history and then Nick Groom has a chapter on the term gothic in the long 18th century and then Dale Townsend, my co-editor, comes in with a consideration upon the Gothic before Horace Walpole, because often we tend to kind of consider the inception of the Gothic at the Castle of Otranto in 1764. But Dale's chapter in particular proves that, you know, it is a literary consideration prior to Horace Walpole. We're not downplaying at all the importance of Horace Walpole and indeed three other chapters offered here consider the importance of Walpole in different ways. Um, Stephen Clark for example has written a really good essay on Horace Walpole and Strawberry Hill and Peter Linfield has written an essay on architecture which really examines um, Strawberry Hill as well so it's great and Anne Williams um, has also written about Shakespeare and the Gothic in the 18th century. And there's a lot of great stuff there as well upon the Castle of Otranto. I think one of the real highlights of this for me amongst many, many delights is, you know, I, 
emergent attention that we've paid and that we asked authors to consider about the 18th century as being such an important century in terms of empire. And we have two chapters in this by Ruth Scobie and Diego Saglia, who, which both in many ways problematise that um, sense of the empire in relation to the Gothic. So Ruth Scobie has written a, a great chapter upon Gothic and the terrors of empire, where besides looking at various Gothic works, she also considers Lord Equiano's interesting narrative. And Diego Saglia talks about Orientalism in his chapter, looking at William Beckford and you know, his history and immersion in Orientalism. And besides that, we have a couple of key historical movements that are covered in volume one. James Watt, for example, looks at the American Revolution, the Gothic, which we think is quite a fresh and rich new chapter. And Fanny Lacotte looks at Gothic and the French Revolution. Now, while at first glance that may seem to be more familiar territory, Gothic and the French Revolution, I think that Fanny Lacotte's chapter really opens up the the kind of debate on the other side of the channel about the Gothic and the French Revolution in France. So this is really fresh and interesting new material. And the history stuff that we're talking about in no way downplays the literary stuff. We've got some really great chapters, for example, by Yale Shapira upon you know, the less well-known authors that came after Anne Radcliffe and Matthew Lewis, some of which were Minerva authors. And Deborah Russell has also written a chapter upon the authors that came between Horace Walpole and Anne Radcliffe. So we think that we've given a, a fairly good and even-handed attention to the literary context as well as the historical contexts. Um, I guess one final highlight is also the philosophical chapters. Um, our final chapter is by Robert Miles, and it's called Gothic and Time. And in it, um, Robert Miles begins with the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor's consideration of time, and then he considers it in relation to the Gothic in the late 18th century. Julian Zagar. Which, um, writes about the history of sexuality um, and of course she brings Michel Foucault's musings upon that into her chapter in the Gothic and sexuality and Eric Parasol um, talks about terror and horror, the key aesthetic philosophical concepts that underpin much of the Gothic in the long 18th century. So there's Lots of different focuses here um, upon, you know, philosophy, history, literary authors, and upon different historical movements in relation to the Gothic. And we hope that you both enjoy it and get a lot from this great volume of essays. We want to thank our contributors, all of them, for the wonderful chapters that we've put in here. Thank you. I'll pass over to Dale now about volume two. Uh, thank you, Angela. Yes, I'd, I'd like to um, begin this by heartily thanking our contributors again for having produced such wonderful, fresh work and for having kept us excited and engaged with this project over several years of planning and conceptualization and editing. I think it's fair to say that when Angela and I were conceptualizing the shape and the structure of the second volume, which is called Gothic in the 19th century, we had to confront two very well-established literary historical narratives. Uh, the first is the very contentious relationship between Romanticism and the Gothic. And the second, the once inveterate assumption that apart from a late flowering during the 1830s, the Gothic rather goes underground after about 1820, only to resurface in British literature with the well-known fictions of Bram Stoker and Oscar Wilde and Robert Louis Stevenson, Robert Louis Stevenson during the Victorian fin de siècle. 
But as our contents list indicates, in volume two, we attempt to revise these assumptions in several ways. So the volume opens, for instance, with a particularly important moment in the history of Gothic literature, which is the gathering of the Shelleys, of Byron, John Polidori, and others on the banks of Lake Geneva in the summer of 1816, as my friend and colleague Angela Wright and Madeleine Callahan's chapter shows mm -hmm. the distinction between the Gothic and Romantic at this particular moment in time is almost inconsequential and writers of both retrospectively constructed literary movements double freely in, in, in both modes. Now in, in challenging the assumption that the Gothic seems to die after the publication of Melmoth's Melmoth the Wanderer by Charles Maturin in 1820. We include chapters in the second volume that pay attention to just how pervasive the Gothic mode is in the work of writers like Charles Dickens, the Brontes, and in fact, in a host of realist and non-realist Victorian literary forms, including sensation fiction, the Victorian theater, poetry, the ghost story, and the domestic novel. But I think we're very keen in this volume to show that the Gothic is much more than an English 19th century literary mode. And we're very keen to give an account of 19th century Gothic beyond England. So we also take care in this volume to provide an overview of the Gothic mode in other national contexts. So we include a chapter on Gothic America, 19th century Goth American Gothic, on Spain and the Gothic, on Italy and the Gothic, and on Scotland and Ireland. And I think this international focus uh, complements the chapters that Angela has already mentioned on the French and the German Gothic in the first volume. Um, and uh, Equally in dialogue with the earlier chapters in, in volume two are the inclusions on race and empire as topics of investigation mm -hmm. in the second volume. So I think throughout volume two is very much in dialogue with, with volume one, and this we continue in the forthcoming volume three. Um, the second volume also includes some critical surprises, like an account of how the rise of the railways in the Victorian period is reflected in Gothic fiction. And I think it's fair to say that we're delighted that these editorial endeavours have generated so much new critical material. And we hope that volume two of the Cambridge History of the Gothic, like volume one, will become not only a standard point of scholarly reference, but also a point of departure for much path-breaking Gothic scholarship in future years. Yeah, absolutely, Dale. I, I couldn't agree more. These two volumes are so complementary, both in terms of you know, how volume one covers German and then French Revolution material in relation to the traditions in those nations. And then volume two takes up other national traditions of Gothic as well. And um, I think it's really important to think about the dialogue between the two volumes, but also the generosity of the scholars and the ways in which they have opened up new fields of research to um, new and early career scholars. Um, I think John Bowne, for example, very generously began his chapter on Dickens and the Gothic by saying, Dickens and the Gothic is one of the great unwritten studies. Um, and I think we both agree with him. And, you know, that type of opening up of conversations, we hope will inspire a new generation of Gothic scholars as well.